In fact, uh, if I just pick out one strand that I remember reading uh, is uh, in a footnote you write that uh, Ambedkar, and that's a that's a uh, and this particular fact is another big theme in the book that Ambedkar is a rational thinker who's who's also influenced uh, Europe by Europe and political thinkers in Europe, uh, and you call him a Europeanist in in, in one place. But uh, I remember you saying that so he's actually pitting this rational thought to. The mad, to what he calls the madness of Manu yeah. and other books that so it's it's really a question of rational thought versus a certain kind of perverse yes, madness. So yes, yes. So so this this uh, um, uh, idea of Europeanism mm -hmm. has to be, as I have written in my book, has to be very rigorously distinguished from Eurocentrism or Europhilia. Mm -hmm. So it is neither a certain axiomatic, unquestioned assumption that there is something inherently superior about Europe right. or the European heritage. To that extent, even the heritage which goes by the name of rationalism or enlightenment, uh, I do not see Ambedkar in any way uh, consciously taking part in any such heritage as a heritage, as a cultural heritage. He's a free thinker. He's a thinker who thinks freely and a thinker of freedom. Uh, so that's the first point. And Europhilia. Uh, um, which is a kind of love of Europe, mm -hmm. a love of uh, things European, whether it be a cultural, um, a cultural eros or um, something which is also political eros, that uh, Europe is also politically more developed, but most important, it's a civilizational eros. Mm -hmm. Europe has a greater civilization. Ambedkar does not in any way, there is no trace of any such evidence that Ambedkar uh, falls into either of these two categories, a Eurocentric uh, uh, bias or a Europhilic um, attachment. But Ambedkar is a Europeanist in the sense that he plunges deep into the European archive, mm -hmm. whether it's a historical archive, the philosophical archive, but he plunges deep into that archive. Why? He plunges deep into the archive to do what everyone must do at that time. And he's not the only one, I'm sure there are others who are doing it. Which is, insofar as Europe is a real presence through the colonial encounter and for other reasons. Because uh, some sort of a global capitalism has already started mm -hmm. at that time. So Europe is a real presence in societies which are non-European. And to that extent, every person who thinks of one's social existence, who wants to historicize one's social existence, to look at one's social, ex social existence reflectively, analytically, precisely to intervene and emancipate that existence, insofar as that existence is also something which is oppressive, mm -hmm. must be able to an dis disassemble, disaggregate everything that makes that reality into, a, uh, again, some sort of a natural uh, phenomenon. You have to disaggregate it to know which parts of that reality are actually being formed on the grounds of some other realities, which are alien realities apparently, culturally alien. And to that extent, Ambedkar goes deep into the archives of Europe to be able to show that these European realities are forming us, but they also are forming horizons of new possibilities for us. Mm -hmm. So it is a double-edged reality. Right. And Pule had already Jyotiba Pule had already shown deep awareness, very keen awareness of this doubleness of the European question. And then I have distinguished between two kinds of Europeanism. There is a philological Europeanism and there is a political Europeanism. The philological Europeanism is a Europeanism which builds its investigations, its research program, to take another term from my title. It takes its research program from texts from the provenance of texts, from the construction, from the languages of texts. And so in India we also find a new Europeanist scholastic, uh, um, though initially of very few such people, but uh, gradually it opens up into, um, into a pretty large uh, Europeanist engagement through the philological point of view. Uh, again, it is reciprocal. Actually, the philological point of view comes from the other side more. That is the Orientalist philology. Yeah. So there is an Indianism of the European philologist as there is an initial Europeanism of the Indian philologist. 
But I do not think Ambedkar quite falls in that category. He is, of course, philologically very competent and brings up extraordinary insights when he reads European texts and thought systems. But he is what I call a political Europeanist. So that's the second category, mm -hmm. a political Europeanism. What is that? A political Europeanism is an Europeanism, is a Europeanism which takes the idea of Europe as an effective political reality in the present beyond Europe. Okay. So some of those ideas indeed are ideas which you could call rational in, as, as uh, ideas which come out of a whole cauldron of thinking in Europe uh, which tries to both define reason as something universal, as a universal human possibility mm -hmm. against its own um, trends or tendencies uh, which were uh, deeply inflected by theological thinking um, and, and um, the, the thinking of politics which is consonant with theology, Christian theology in particular. Uh, so there is that modern European counter-tendency, which Ambedkar definitely takes um, deep, um, mouthfuls off, as it were. Uh, uh, but, uh, you see, for Ambedkar, the concepts that come from Europe are not, in that sense, in any way, the cultural property of Europe. This is the crucial thing. Mm -hmm. Because when these ideas become effective, for instance, the French Revolution ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity. These ideas become effective as an intra-European break, a kind of Europe becoming strange to itself. We call that revolution. So revolution is a kind of estrangement of the subject itself. So in the same way that there is no natural India, there is no natural Europe. Right. So in that sense, methodologically, he takes the self-estrangement of Europe in its revolutionary moments, particularly the French Revolution, as a very important point of departure to think about India in that same way. But that's a methodological, it's not a substantive model that he takes from Europe. Yeah. So in that sense, he's a political Europeanist insofar as the method of politics is something that he learns from through reading the European archives. But paradoxically, precisely by the dint of Europe becoming strange to itself or Europe becoming questioned by its own, its, its, its own developments. Mm -hmm. yeah? So there is no Europe. That's the idea of politics. Again, to go back to my term, politics is divisionary. It divides every pre-given so-called natural subject, whether Europe or India. Mm -hmm. So yeah.